If you could put your brain in a robot and live forever, would you do it? Would you consider yourself to be alive or would you be a robot? So the components that make up cells, by themselves, they don't define life. But when you put them together in very particular ways, then they have what we call life. Life is a quality that distinguishes matter that has biological processes such as signaling and self-sustainment from matter that does not. So I challenge you to stop thinking of life in a binary way, so either dead or alive, and to start thinking about life as a process. A living thing is the system where the process of life occurs. You are a human body made up of non-living things, but together in the system, they put together processes of life. Okay, so we've got life out of the way. Now let's move on to robots. So if a robot can achieve within it the processes of life, then by definition, the robot is living. Robots are mechanical systems that are defined as interconnected, interactive, cognitive, and physical tools that can perceive the environment using sensors, reason about events, make plans using algorithms implemented in computer programs, and perform tasks autonomously or with guidance. So what happens when we integrate robotics and biology? Well, we get biorobotics. Biorobotics is the process of using biological organisms and robotics as a way to develop new technologies by giving machines the ability to have biological senses that can react to the environment. The development of flying machines was actually inspired by birds using biomimicry to create lift and create aerodynamic shapes that can sustain flight. Okay, so we've got biology, robots, robotics, life, the two sort of merged into these interconnected fields. But what happens when we programmatically and physically merge robots and biology together into one form? Well, we get living robots. So to understand what a living robot is, I wanna start off with a simple analogy. So DNA is made up of five atoms, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon. Now most stars are also made up of these elements as well, but that doesn't mean that DNA are stars. The same way a pencil is made of wood, that doesn't mean a pencil is a tree. The parts of the tree were used to make something completely different with a completely separate set of functions and purposes. A few years back, a team of scientists executed the same concept in biology, and they created a brand new type of artifact never before seen in nature. This artifact is neither any traditional robot nor any organism seen in the world. They created the world's first living programmable organism known as a xenobot. What they did was scraped embryonic cells from an African frog, specifically the species Xenopus lavis, and assembled them into a new life form named xenobots. They're a robotic organism that's a millimeter wide, can move towards targets, pick things up, and even heal themselves. The design of the organism was chosen amongst thousands of new biological life forms created by the University of Vermont's Deep Green Supercomputer Cluster, and then it was assembled by biologists at Tufts University. Basically how they do it is the scientists tell the supercomputer what type of functions they want the animal to have, and then the supercomputer will shift through thousands and thousands of variations of designs of cells until they come up with the right combination that can achieve that function. Once the concept is created, the scientists take the design, they gather stem cells, and then they separate them into individual cells and put them in a culture of salt water. And from there, they cut the cells and join them apart in different ways to achieve the shape of the supercomputer's design. And voila, they create life forms never before seen in nature. These organisms are literally programmed like a robot. Programming that can be tweaked and changed to fit different functions of how we want these organisms to exist, the things that they can do. So one way the scientists decided to manipulate these xenobots is to punch holes through them. So that's what they did. They punched a hole through the xenobots, basically turn them into little microscopic kangaroos, and then the xenobots will go about in their, in their little culture and they would pick up random particles and move them around. Then the scientists were like, hmm, well, if they can pick up particles, we wonder if they could pick up loose stem cells. So that's what the scientists did. They put loose stem cells in the petri dishes, and then basically the xenobots would randomly pick up these stem cells, put them in their little pouch, move around with them, and then they did something really unexpected. The xenobots would take these stem cells and they would begin to put them together into the shape of a xenobot. It's actually a type of reproduction called kinetic replication, and it's only ever been seen on molecular levels, 
never on the level of cells. So these xenobots are composed of 100% frog DNA. But they're not frogs. They are biologically programmed pseudo-frog robots. So in the very same way that the universe delivers instructions and ingredients to make stars, which then form planets that deliver instructions and ingredients to make bio-robots called human beings, we can manipulate the world around us to create new living beings into existence. One day, scientists believe that xenobots will be able to do things that current robots and organisms can't do, like shift through contaminated radiation, or enter into the human bloodstream into human arteries and scrape out plaque. But xenobots aren't the only breakthrough in this technology. Just recently, a group of researchers at the University of Illinois created a living computer using 80,000 mouse brain cells. So what they did was they basically reprogrammed mouse stem cells and then they grew a collection of 80,000 neurons. And then they placed this layer of 80,000 neurons into a little computer that has um, optical fiber and different lighting systems. And then they would flash lights on these cells and then what, what would happen is 30 minutes later, these cells would actually remember the, the light patterns. So one day scientists believe that we'll be able to build complex biocomputers using brain cells to create a type of computer that is faster than traditional computers and stores much more information. But just how the xenobots unexpectedly replicated, scientists believe that if we built a computer neural network large enough, it would start to yield unexpected results that were not trained in the program. As exciting as this is, there are major concerns. When we build these living robotic organisms, as small as they are, we'll never be able to predict unexpected outcomes of evolved conditions. Now, I want to give credit for the following example to an article that I read from the University of Vermont. Like an ant colony, it begins with a single unit, a tiny ant, from which it would be impossible to predict the shape of their colony or how they could build bridges over water when they come together. Just like an ant's unpredictability, we may build living robots that seem harmless on the surface, but in fact, when you factor in advanced and evolved conditions, they could cause great harm to us and our planet. And just how these risks exist with biology and robotic organisms, artificial intelligence itself has been advancing exponentially over the last few years, which poses a risk. So much so that leaders like Elon Musk have expressed their fear that advancing artificial intelligence is getting out of control. So to most of us who don't work in the fields of artificial intelligence, biology, and robotics, it appears to us that things are under control with research, development, and application of these technologies. Because after all, it's the experts who are building these things, so we should be in good hands, right? Well, it's these same experts who know the depths of these systems and how they work who express their own concerns. Alexander Madry, a professor and director of MIT Center for Deployable Machine Learning, says the government cannot leave AI regulation to big tech that the government must take responsibility of ensuring that artificial intelligence is consistent with society's goals and that it's developed to benefit all people. And that the government should not only regulate this, but it should be deeply involved in asking questions to corporations about why and how they're developing algorithms. Because if there is no regulation, it can pose a severe threat to humanity. So you may have recently heard news about Joffrey Hinton. He's a professor at Toronto and is also an engineer at Google. He is the godfather of AI. He is a pioneer in deep learning and helped develop techniques like backpropagation, which is the algorithm that machines use to learn. So he stepped down from Google recently and expressed his concerns about why he's changed his mind between the relationship between the brain and digital intelligence. Now he's always thought that computer intelligence would never be as good as the human brain. But with the recent release of GPT-4, he has completely changed his mind. So the language models of AI have about a trillion connections and systems like GPT-4 know much more information than humans do. In fact, they know about a thousand times more than we do, if not more. But they have one trillion connections, whereas we have a hundred trillion connections. So they are extremely better at gathering a thousand times more knowledge in just a fraction of the connections. And the reason he believes this is possible is because backpropagation, the learning algorithm of machines, is better than our brains. So as we continue to advance these AI systems, increase their connections, so their IQ goes from 80 to 200, they'll be able to easily manipulate people, like an adult manipulating a child. We wouldn't even know it's happening. And since computers can instantaneously transfer all of their information to other computers, especially with easy access like the internet, 
In the snap of a finger, the end of humanity could begin. So recently, at the end of March 2023, Elon Musk and other big tech founders, researchers, and scientists wrote a letter to the government asking them to put a halt on artificial intelligence labs who are training AI systems more powerful than GPT-4 for at least six months because this increasingly AI race is putting a huge profound risk on society. They suggested that if a pause is not put into place soon, the government should step in and create a moratorium, which is a legal suspension of all activities. Government regulation on such a new and precarious science is not only the ethical thing to do, it's the safe thing to do. And artificial intelligence is just one part of a much bigger picture. People are worried about AIs taking over and autonomously deprecating human necessity. Now throw biology into the mix. Imagine GPT-4 evolved into GPT-50, but built and operated on a neural network of human brain cells with an IQ of 800. It sounds compelling, exciting, and adventurous, but it also sounds like the ending of a sci-fi film where humans are the antagonist, a film that I certainly wouldn't want to be in.